Welcome to Understanding Your Bible. I'm glad you've tuned in, and I hope that the broadcast will be a blessing to you. I would encourage you, if you would, to take your Bible and follow along as we study uh, the Scriptures. Tonight, we're going to be talking about some things in relation to uh, the church, the body of Christ, and uh, the revelation of Paul concerning that church. Over the past few weeks, we've been studying uh, the teachings of Christ. And in this, what we've tried to point out is that the teachings of Christ are found all the way through the New Testament. Uh, however, we've got a chart on the board up here that we use quite frequently. And uh, what we're trying to show is that the past teachings of Christ are found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are called the Gospels. That was Christ's earthly ministry. During that period of time, Jesus Christ preached the gospel of the kingdom. He called out 12 men and committed that gospel to them. He said they were not to go to the Gentiles, but only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he had taught them to observe the law of Moses. After his death on Calvary in the early part of Acts, the Lord Jesus Christ continued uh, through them that ministry of preaching the gospel of the kingdom. However, in Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is saved, and the next 13 books in your Bible are Romans through Philemon. The teachings of Christ for today are found in these books. Many times we refer to those as the teachings of Paul, and they are the epistles of Paul. But what we've try, been trying to point out over the last several weeks is, is those, those are the teachings of Christ uh, for us today in the church and body of Christ. Hebrews through Revelation, on the other hand, have to do with the teachings of Christ concerning the nation Israel uh, in a period of time that is yet future, and that is the tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ and the new heaven and new earth. So as we talked about the teachings of Christ for today, we've been looking at some things that are unique uh, to those teachings that differ from time past. You can break your Bible down into really three time periods. But now, uh, and then of course the time past, but now, and that which is to come. And so we're concerned with the teachings of Christ for us today. And we find those teachings in Romans through Philemon. Now, as I pointed out in our very first study, uh, we are to read all the Bible. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, proof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. So all Scripture is inspired. All Scripture is equally inspired. But as we read through the Scriptures, we find that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus Christ, in His earthly ministry, came to the Jew and is preaching to them and teaching them through the disciples. Same is true in the first part of Acts. But once Paul is saved, a, a new organism is started. As a matter of fact, in these studies, we have looked at several things that are new, uh, that are revealed through the teachings of Christ that come through Romans through Philemon. For example... Uh, the past teachings of Christ <clears throat> involve many things that people who say they base their doctrine on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do not really put in practice. Uh, Matthew 5, we saw over there where Jesus Christ said, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. He said, If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, he said, Take to, no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. Uh, he said, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. Uh, he said, Ask, and it shall be given you. You see, all of these promises were to the twelve and to them as they conducted their ministry among the nation Israel. And so, people today who say that they base the church doctrine on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John really do not because we find many passages there where uh, we are instructed, they're instructed to do certain things that people simply do not do today. And we believe that you ought to believe that the Bible means what it says, where it says it, to whom it says it. And by rightly dividing the word of truth, you can distinguish between the kingdom doctrine associated with Israel and church doctrine, which is for all men. Uh, and of course, those that are saved make up that church, that body, which is the church. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, in the teachings of Christ that we find through the Apostle Paul in Romans through Philemon, we've seen that there were... There was a new apostle. That apostle was Paul. He was not one of the twelve. He was uh, given a separate and distinct ministry and message. He said the ministry he had received was to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And we read about that ministry in Acts chapter 9 during Paul's conversion. Acts chapter 26 as Paul is before Agrippa. 
He gives an account of that salvation. And then in Romans through Philemon, we read the doctrine over there that we see becomes quite different from the doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so the Apostle Paul is the new apostle. With that, there is a new commission. Uh, today, much of Christianity uh, says they are keeping or are carrying out the great commission of Matthew 28 and Mark 16. But again, in the study that we did, uh, we saw that uh, people are not really following that commission. They just take parts of it, and they're not following the entire commission. Our commission for the church, the body of Christ, is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That is the ministry of reconciliation, and he says we are ambassadors for Christ. Then uh, last time, uh, we talked about the fact that there was a new gospel that was given by the Lord Jesus Christ through the Apostle Paul. And Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached to me, I, I didn't receive it of man, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Today, what I want us to look at for uh, the time that we have remaining in the broadcast is a new organism that was formed uh, through the preaching of the gospel given by the Lord Jesus Christ to the Apostle Paul. That organism is called the church, which is his body. Uh, in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, the Bible says, And he, speaking of Jesus Christ, is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Notice there that the Bible says he is the head of the body, the church. Uh, back in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, that body is spoken of, and uh, again, it is the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 says, "...hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him." that filleth all in all. Now, I want you to notice in the Scriptures that uh, there are really three different churches that are mentioned. In Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, uh, the Bible talks about the church that was in the wilderness. And by the way, the word church is simply a, of the Greek word ekklesia, which means a called out group or a body, a called out body. In Acts 7 verse 38, the Bible says there, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai when with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Notice that there was a church in the wilderness. That's talking about the nation Israel back there when they came out of Egypt. And that group that came out was called a church. That is not the church which is the body of Christ. That church was a church of, of Israelites that God Almighty brought out of Egypt and dealt with them through the law. Uh, the Bible says He spake to them in Mount Sinai and with our fathers, <clears throat> and they received the lively oracles to give unto us. Then there is a church that Jesus Christ mentions in Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to the twelve, and He addresses uh, Peter uh, particularly. Uh, he says there in verse... Uh, 15, he saith unto, well, let's move back up to verse 14. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, and some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Notice that up there in verse 18 he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the rock is not the man, Peter. The, the rock that he's speaking of there is the confession that Peter made. He said, Who do men say that I am? And he said, But who do you say that I am? And he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the foundation upon which this Jewish church was built. And this is the church that we find over in Acts chapter 2, 
Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, when they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and they go out and begin their ministry in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then into the uttermost parts of the earth. And so this church is a church that has to do with Israelites. Uh, as a matter of fact, over in Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter is preaching there this murder indictment to the nation Israel. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, uh, in verse 36, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Uh, back in verse 22, he said, Ye men of Israel. Uh, <clears throat> verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. So it's, it's obvious who the audience is here. Uh, they are obeying the command of chapter 1 when he said, Start in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. And so Peter is preaching to the men of Israel. Notice the message in verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricking their heart and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, in light of the fact that we have crucified the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for all these years, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, everybody today that, that uh, practices water baptism as a means of salvation, baptismal regeneration it's called, uses Acts 2.38 to prove uh, baptismal regeneration. Acts 2.38 is water baptism. There's no doubt about that. And we're going to be doing a study probably next week on baptism. Uh, but that is water baptism. It's the same baptism of Matthew chapter 3. It's the same baptism of Matthew 28 and Mark 16. But you see, if you rightly divide the word of truth, you can believe that that is water baptism because uh, it's clear that it is. And still understand that baptism today has no part in our salvation. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And he said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as far as Israel is concerned, and as far as this church is concerned, uh, at Jerusalem, water baptism was essential. Uh, he said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And notice uh, the verse 39, he says, For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they gladly received his word. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And if you go all the way down to verse 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, there is a church there. It begins with this preaching of this gospel of the kingdom. The fact that Jesus Christ has come. <clears throat> you rejected him, but he was the Messiah. And he said, well, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, I want you to notice something uh, that really is a, a source of great misunderstanding among many people. This church, this Jewish church of Acts chapter 2... Uh, that these people are added to is the church that Jesus Christ talked about in Matthew 16. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. That church was to be made up of Jews, and it was to made up of, be made up of Gentiles who would come through the Jewish nation, bless them, uh, and so forth. And we'll read about that in Matthew 25. This church is referred to in the Scriptures as the Bride of Christ. In John chapter 3, in verse 27, John, the Bible says, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. Remember, John is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He says, You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. 
But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Now, I want you to understand that the Jesus Christ, in the context there, is the bridegroom. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Well, when we get over to Revelation, uh, you read all the way through the New Testament, you get over to Revelation chapter uh, 21, you find a reference to this bride. And there are many parables in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that talk about uh, the bride and the bridegroom. In, in Revelation chapter 21, after the great white throne judgment, verse 1 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now keep in mind that in prophecy, after Jesus Christ came, was cut off, according to Daniel chapter 9, the only, the only thing left in the fulfilled prophecy was the seven years of tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ. After the church is filled up, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, the church will be removed from the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ will resume His program with the nation Israel, and the tribulation will come upon this earth. It will last for seven years. The last three and a half years will be great tribulation. At the end of that time period, the Lord Jesus Christ will return to earth. The battle of Armageddon will take place. And then the millennial reign of Christ, where Jesus Christ will sit upon the throne of David. The twelve apostles will be resurrected to sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, as was promised to them in Matthew 19. And the, the promise of the thousand year reign will be fulfilled. At the end of that reign, there will be the great white throne judgment. And you read about that in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 11. He said, I saw a great white throne, so forth and so on. In other words, there is a great white throne judgment. After that, there is a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And the Bible says the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now notice what happens. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. There is a city there in heaven. And all the inhabitants, uh, those Jewish inhabitants, those Gentiles that came through the Jews, make up this body, this church that is called the bride of Christ. It's called the holy city, New Jerusalem. The apostle Paul makes reference to the time when this is going to take place, but he also makes reference to the fact that the church, the body of Christ, is a separate and distinct organism that was not formed until he came forth preaching the gospel of the grace of God. Uh, you see, in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us, notice, the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him." You see, there's going to come a time when the body of Christ is going to be united with the bride of Christ. We are His body. The body and the bride are not the same. The relationship is spoken of as being the same many places throughout Paul's epistles. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, he talks about the body of Christ and he says uh, there in uh, Ephesians 5, verse 30, For we are members of His body and of His flesh and of His bones. He said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You see, folks, every time you read the word church, it doesn't speak of the same group of people. It's interesting that many people will say, Well, uh, you know, the church there in Acts chapter 2 is the same church in Matthew 16, and it's the same church that Paul preached. Well, what about that church in Acts chapter 7? You read about the church there, the church in the wilderness. Well, obviously, it's not the same church as in Acts chapter 2. And so we see that with the Apostle Paul, 
There is a new organism formed and it's called the church which is his body and that reference, the church which is his body, is never made anywhere in the Bible other than through the Apostle Paul. Now why is it that I say that the Apostle Paul uh, is the one that, that began, or this church began with the Apostle Paul? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, uh, or verse 12, 1 Timothy 1, 12, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy here, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy. Now notice that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should have to believe on him to life everlasting. Notice again over here on the chart that it, we have the books broken down in exactly the order that they occur in your Bible. When Paul is saved in Acts chapter 9, it's interesting that even though the Lord Jesus Christ told Peter back in Matthew 16, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. After that church begins there in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, Paul is saved in Acts 9, and the next 13 books in your Bible are Paul's epistles. Folks, it's evident that God wanted us to know the things concerning the church, the body of Christ, concerning grace, through the Apostle Paul, and thus the Bible is arranged in the order that it is. And you get over there to Hebrews, and the first book over there is called Hebrews. Well, Hebrews are Jews. And James, the next book, says to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, which is not Gentiles, it's Jews. And all the way through there, the doctrine has to do with the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, and the millennial reign of Christ. Paul's doctrine, given through the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans through Philemon, is the doctrine for the church, the body of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul said, As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another man buildeth thereupon. In other words, the, well, that which Paul preached about Jesus Christ, and that is that Christ died for our sins, was buried and was raised again the third day, is the doctrine that he laid out as the foundation upon which the church was to be built. <clears throat> and he said, Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So the church, which is his body, is the church which is referred to in Romans through Philemon. In Ephesians 1.22, we read there where he said, He hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. You see, that distinguishes the church from the one which is his bride. The church which is his bride is the church of Matthew 16, Acts 2, Revelation chapter 21. The church which is his body is the church of Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 says that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Well, what is that body? It's the body of Christ. Ephesians 3, verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Ephesians 4, verse 4, there is one body. Uh, that one body says there's one spirit, even if you're calling one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. All of those ones have to do with the new things that were brought about by the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Apostle Paul. In Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 23, he says, For he is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. And as we read a moment ago in verse 30, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. This body started with the Apostle Paul with his salvation in Acts chapter 9, as we read in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, that in me first he might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. Now the reason that this is so significant, folks, is because that the salvation of these two groups differs greatly in the scriptures. Uh, the church, which is his bride, is based upon the doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The doctrine of repentance by water, uh, through water baptism, remission of sins through water baptism, so forth and so on. 
Uh, but today, in the dispensation of grace, people are placed into the church, which is his body, by simply believing the gospel. And that gospel is what Paul called the gospel of Christ and the gospel of the grace of God. That is, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, the significance and the importance of all this is, is that today... People are saved on the basis of God's grace. If you've never been saved, maybe you joined the church, maybe you walked the aisle, confessed your sins, turned over a new leaf, quit smoking, drinking, doing all those things, but there was never a time in your life that you trusted Jesus Christ, then you're not in the body of Christ. And if you're not in the body of Christ, you're not going to be taken out or away from this earth before the wrath uh, like the body of Christ is. And so you need to be part of that body. How can that happen? Simply by trusting in what Jesus Christ did. Believe that He became your sacrifice on Calvary. Accept that as a payment for your sin. Believe that He's forgiven you all trespasses, made you complete in Christ. And if you'll believe that, trust that, and accept that, God Almighty will save you and by His Spirit place you into this new body, the body of Christ. Grace Bible Church extends to you and your family a cordial invitation to join us for our Sunday services. Bible classes begin at 10 a.m. with morning service at 11 and informal evening Bible study at 6 p.m. For more information, phone 847-0768. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Understanding Your Bible. For more information, write to the address on your screen or call 423-847-0768. Be sure to be with us again next week for another edition of Understanding Your Bible.